Hello, everybody. Welcome to Colts to Consciousness and Amanda Ray. We are joined here live. You guys just absolutely loved our episodes together. And so, of course, we had to do more. And I just wanted everyone to have the opportunity to come on and ask questions and do all the things. So if you are coming in from the Colts to Consciousness side, definitely just right now go and subscribe to Amanda Ray. She has some amazing content over there. We're talking. She's talking about polygamy in the Kingston cult and her whole family bush and it's pretty exciting and if you're coming in from Amanda's side if I may say please subscribe to cults to consciousness <laughs> doing all yes. the culty things over here <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yes. So we also have Jonathan, my glorious husband slash co-producer. He's over here as the moderator. So if you see any Cults to Consciousness stuff coming up in the chat, that would be him. He's going to be starring your comments and uh, moving over the super chat so we can get to those and answer your questions. And yeah, let's get into it. So I have a couple comments that I wanted to start with. And then and we I was can kind just of shocked see. with how many comments were about incest. I mean, not <laughs> that would be the most, right? But I mean, it's the the oddest thing, I guess you could say, or the most intriguing because people have heard about polygamy. But when it comes to incestuous polygamy, it's like, wait, what? That's an extra layer that most people yeah. aren't familiar with. Um, I had to start with this one because I loved it. So this is from Lizzie Pop and they go in all caps, love you two together, slay boss babes, your wisdom and life lessons are inspiring. That's very sweet. So thank Aww, you for that. that <laughs> and a then of course, were, saying we're like a dynamic duo, which I really like. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so good. And of course, everyone was singing your praises, Amanda, in the comments, which I was just loving. They're like, she's amazing. And oh. this one from A. Powell, they say, the Kingstons didn't account for strong, intelligent women. My heart, soul, and blessings go out to you, Amanda. You are the David to their Goliath. Oh, that's so cute. So sweet. So, so sweet. Um, okay, so let's start with one of these. This one's from Rhonda, and I, I pulled these directly from the videos that we just did. So okay. if you're new to the channel or you're just like, what's going on here? We are going to be answering questions and kind of diving a little bit deeper into the episodes that I just did with Amanda over on my channel, which we went into the incestuous polygamy, the coerced polygamy, and also just her general overall story in the Kingston cult, which is a branch of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, a polygamous branch. Uh oh, I just got the notification from my AirPod that it's low battery. Let me try this one. I don't want to lose you right in the middle of it. <laughs> uh, that would Probably suck. Okay. Yeah, so bear with us, guys. Um, this is like my third live stream ever, so I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> You're doing so good. Okay, so, so great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. Okay, so this one from Rhonda. I'd love for you guys to cover why this group needs to be taken down by the FBI and IRS. They should not be tax exempt when they violate labor laws and all kinds of other abuse. So I guess the first question is, do you know if they are tax exempt or registered as their own religion, like the mainstream Mormons are? Last I checked, they were like, if you look at the front of their church, so there's big black gates now, like that you can't even enter anymore. After I left, like they closed these gates, so you can't even go in. So it's technically not even open to the public, right? But yeah. um, if you see on the front, at least the last time I went to go look at it, <laughs> there's this little sign that you can barely see. It says LDCC, like Church of Christ. So there, I think there's like requirements to be able to be a tax exempt, right? And I think one of those is to have to have that, but it's very small. You can barely see it. And it's like uh, uh, the paint has been like peeled off to where it's like the, you can't even see it unless you're like right next to it. And I always wondered why they did it that way. It was that way even when I was in the order. So I feel like they, at least back when I found, have talked to someone who was in the group that had the information, they did say that they were tax exempt, which is, it's so insane that they can be, that they're basically getting the funds and the help to be able to be a oppressive cult. <laughs> it's, especially too, when it comes to, I don't know, we didn't even cover Vanguard, their, their school that they claim is public. They have gotten million dollars in um, funds for, because public schools get these funds, right? 
Right. So they got million dollars in these funds and it was actually on the news because these people were investigating. They're like, every single student is a Kingston student and they're all white and it's definitely not a public school. So uh, I, I guarantee you, if they can get away with it, they will be tax exempt for as long as they can. <laughs> right. And there's some other shady things going on as far as defrauding the government, right? Like they're trying to get away with a whole bunch of things. What was the latest thing that you mentioned in one of your videos about the billion dollar scam against the government? Oh, yeah. So so um, Jacob Kingston. So he's Daniel Kingston's son. Daniel Kingston is the leader's brother. So he would be, you know, the nephew of the leader. He started this biodiesel company where he was basically cutting corners and uh, claiming that he was selling this biodiesel. And the government will give you a dollar per gallon of biodiesel, um, I guess, as a as a t tax credit, right? Because you're you're doing this th great thing for the environment. But what he mm -hmm. was doing was he was making it look like he was shipping all of this like <laughs> biodiesel, but he wasn't. And he was working with this other guy that owned a gas station. He ended up, they both ended up, I think, in total, taking about a billion from the government. Wow. And then, yeah, he got caught on his way to Turkey. They arrested him at the airport. So he just got charged. But that's just one case where they got caught. And the crazy thing is the leadership is so good at not putting their names on anything. Because you you really think that, we talked about the law of one above another, right? So you have to tie into your, your parents and then they right. tie into the leadership. So no one really does anything without permission, right? And you don't think that those funds were going to the leadership. And of course, they were benefiting, but they they were smart enough to where the leadership didn't have their name or anything tied to it so that they couldn't get put in prison or pro prosecuted for it. But they'll get the benefits from it. Of course. Yeah, that sounds mm -hmm. familiar. <laughs> Mormons, <laughs> regular Mormons, right? Um, mm -hmm. Wow, that's wild. So going back to this commenter question, what are some, I mean, I could list a few, but I want you to list a few reasons that the FBI should just take out these leaders and free these women. The, the, the thing that's tricky about it is because um, the only other time that I've seen like legal action come into one of these cults, uh, well, polygamous cults is when the FLDS was raided, right? In te the Texas raid. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like they just like split up all these families and um, right. So I don't know how they would do it in a way to where because the sad thing is like we were talking about in the last video, like the women become the oppressors too. the women yeah. become the abusers. So how do you solve the issue? I guess you have to start from from the things you can get them on, like the incest and then the um, the, the, the tax. Yeah, the tax fraud, I think, is the easiest thing to get them for because there's a somewhat of a paper trail. But I don't know. There's so much incest going on. There's so many people that are born with uh, their parents being siblings and nothing's being done about it. But I also am like, what would that look like if the, if the government did step in? Have you ever seen the government come and be like, hey, stop slaving with your sister? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, that's something that I noticed from the Keep Sweet, Pray and Obey documentary is – when they did, they finally were able to go in and remove all of these children. You had these mothers who were just beside themselves and upset at the government because also they didn't really realize the abuses that were going on because they were so isolated. We talk about all the time on my podcast about when you grow up in a crazy reality or an alternate reality, right? That's different from mainstream society. You don't even know that it's different because that is your reality. And so mm -hmm. when they were breaking up these families, they were upset at the government for coming in and essentially liberating them. And that brings me to a comment here in the chat. Um, what would happen to all the people in that group if it was taken down, all those wives and kids? Do you know what they ended up doing? I think they reunited them, right, from the documentary with the Warren Jeffs compound in Texas? I think so. Yeah, I'd have to ask one of my FLDS friends, but I think eventually they got reunited. But yeah, there was a lot of people upset and frustrated with it. So I don't know. I have like mixed beliefs on on how that all happened because most of my friends who came from the FLDS still have um, hard feelings about it, even though they left. You know, they they feel mm. like that they, they should have handled the situation better. But it's also like it. I mean, damned if you do, damned if you don't. You know, like if you yeah. don't do anything about it, then it's 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 worse. <laughs> so I don't know. It's really hard. 
Yeah. But. Um, quick technical tip. Someone in the comments was asking if we could see more of your, your face. Are you able to tip down your laptop oh, a little like bit? On the, on the on the edge. Oh, that's better. Can you see me a little more now? I can't yeah, even see better. what I look like right now. Hang on. Oh. <laughs> But a little bit better. Yeah. yeah, that's better. It just keeps us more on a, the same plane. Okay, so I have another comment, which I thought was really interesting from one of your videos. Okay, um, I have one more thing to say. Sorry about the. I know yeah, that please. The, the incest and stuff like that. Um, I would like that to stop, obviously. But the thing that I, I should have uh, mentioned this when you were asking that question. I think Utah needs to step up more because there's been so many times where abuse has been reported and nothing has been done or the kid yeah. has been sent back home uh, wow. with, with the bruises on them. You know what I mean? So I think that Utah, Utah is such a family state where they just want to put them back with the family. But in a lot of these cases, that's not the best option for these kids. And they end up um, there. There ends up being a really sad aftermath because of it. So yeah. I just wanted to mention that there because I want Utah to do something or figure something out to a better process. Yeah, for sure. Um, this commenter, I think it was on the incest video because, guys, there's a whole episode on this. If you're interested, I'll have Jonathan link it below so you can save it in your watch history. But this commenter says, I'd love for you guys to cover why this group needs. Oh, sorry. That's the same one. Hi. Uh -huh. OK. Um, I wonder if part of the reason they have each wife have a separate house is to keep the half siblings apart so they feel less gross about being expected to marry each other. And before you answer, I have another really interesting comment. Um, it says, historical note for you. I think in ancient Egypt, they did marry siblings. Biology note, there is absolutely a difference in whether or not you guys grow up with someone or not. When you grow up with someone, there is a phenomenon called the Westermark effect that tends to make you feel instinctively that you shouldn't marry that person. In contrast, when you don't know the person at all, there can be such a thing as genetic sexual attraction, which is basically where a person is attracted to the similarities in that person, sometimes without knowing the other person is related. For good wow. reason, we have laws and morals forbidding that. Not an excuse to blame the kids, though, since they have no control over their lineage. I just found that to be really interesting. Have you heard of that before? I haven't heard of the genetic thing, but I have heard of we are attracted to what's familiar. So yeah. I have seen random like news articles on people who find out that they were somewhat related when they got married. But it makes sense that you you're more attracted to what you're comfortable with. So it's also like familiar faces are more beautiful to you just because they're familiar, right? Oh, so, that's, and that's really also why a lot of time have you I mean, I've noticed this, but I also have a different group of people than you that I grew up around or, or <laughs> even it, as an adult. That's also why you notice or I notice that um, a lot of couples end up looking very similar. Have you noticed like they kind right. of look like, like they siblings? could be related <laughs> yes. and, and maybe they're not. But it's just that they I think it's the fam familiarity, I guess, that causes them to feel comfortable. And trusting. That's so interesting. Well, I didn't marry someone that looks like a sibling, but I did marry someone that looks like my childhood crush. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So we <laughs> joke because um, my childhood crush was Usher. Like the second that yeah. <laughs> I saw him over <laughs> <laughs> what the, the second that I started liking boys because I initially thought Usher was annoying and then once I was like oh boys are cool I just got this big crush on him and my husband does look very much like Usher you can go to my community page and see a picture of him um, and he says that I look like his childhood crush which is a young Demi Moore and Winnie Cooper right babe so wow. who knows, maybe have, that plays into it. I have a lot of questions about that. I don't think we answered fully the, um, basically my answer to the whole like if different homes for the yeah. women. I think honestly, that's more of like, uh, they didn't want, to, they were trying to blend into society and they knew that they were gonna be outed if a bunch of wives were living in the same home, right? With a bunch of kids, right. so it's more, more for like blending in. And I also think that the group is all about owning a bunch of properties. And then another one is like the wives, at least in my family would have killed each other. <laughs> so it's probably right. better for everybody. <laughs> um, but I did have a question about you, um, you guys getting married when you guys oh, yeah. went, so you left, um, were you kind of ostracized or, or did you have, do you still have a relationship with your family and did they come to the yeah. wedding? 
Oh, yeah. Okay. So great question. I left 12 years ago now. So I was 20 ish when I left. And at that point, I didn't know, but I kind of set my parents on a path to leaving by asking them all of my questions because I was just like, what's going on with this or this or this? Let me pull out my binder and my tabs and ask you everything that I found on the internet. And they didn't have the answers, so they took that binder to their higher ups and they didn't have the answers. So that kind of set them on the path of discovery for themselves. So Mm -hmm. they left shortly after me and I feel really lucky that that's the case. Um, In fact, I (laughs) I always tell this story just because I think it's funny. So they had a coming out call to me where they got me on speaker and they were just all nervous. I'm like, what is going on? Why are they being so weird? And they're like, we just want to talk to you about something. They didn't know I'd left at this point. We just want to let you know that we've decided that we're not really going to church anymore and we've taken off our garments. But if you want to get married in the temple, we will be there. We will do anything it takes to be at your wedding. And I just thought it was the sweetest thing. And I was like, oh, guys, you're fine. I left like six months ago. And they're like, oh, we're so glad (laughs) Wow, (laughs) because they were worried about me. Because that's how devout I was. I was in it to win it. I was going all the way, right? And I always talked about getting married in the temple because that's what you have to do. It's what you should aspire to do if you're one of the best Mormons. So yeah, Uh, fast forward. I get married and not in the temple, shocker. And it was this incredible wedding. It, in fact, we have two whole episodes coming out next week just about how it's it's called my not so Mormon wedding. <laughs> and we talk about oh, no. all of the ways that it was different and better for me personally, because I also wanna point out that I don't think that weddings in the temple are lesser than but it definitely was not the way that I wanted to go it was not my perfect wedding so yeah it was incredible and on the family ostracization thing I would say I didn't experience that with my immediate family which was really nice it was the extended family that would say things behind my back and you know, just not really talk to me anymore, especially because I live in, I lived in Vegas at the time and then I moved to Los Angeles and I'm doing all these sinful things like modeling in scantily clad clothes and, you know, all the stuff that (laughs) makes them turn up their nose at you. So Mm -hmm. that kind of stuff, but I would say not really anything directly to my face or being mean in that way. When -hmm. it came to my wedding, I'm the youngest of, I want to say 46 or 47 grandkids on my dad's side. So everyone has already been married and procreated and tripled and quadrupled in size. So if I were to invite my entire extended family, we would have had like a 400 person wedding. And I did not want that. I wanted like 30 people at the wedding. We ended up with Mm -hmm. like 150, (laughs) but wow, that's um, a pretty big. Yeah, because Jonathan invited his whole family and he has his own traditions and customs. So when it came to my guest list, though, it was really only like 45 people, including the plus ones. And I Mm -hmm. really made an effort to just invite the ones who have actively been in my life and actively care to see how I'm doing. And and I'm in their lives and it felt very uh, mutually beneficial. And I didn't want to invite people who I would have to catch up with at the wedding. I wanted yeah. people who were in my inner, inner, inner circle, especially because I'm more of an introvert, which might surprise people. But in big groups, I tend to kind of recede. And I just wanted to be able to relax and have a good time at the wedding. So I only had is it one cousin because another cousin wasn't able to come. Uh, two cousins weren't able to come due to their own conflicts and stuff. But I think I only had one cousin there. So yeah. That's it for my yeah. family. I'm such but... an introvert. I just invited 40 of my closest friends. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm like, wait, 40? Um, Maybe that's, that's why we really mesh so though. well. Yeah. I'm, I'm Introverts unite. Yeah, like, that's awesome that you were not ostracized. But I'm also wondering, now that you're doing this channel, have you noticed Right, a right, right, right. It's one thing well, to leave, and it's another to blash for my. That's what my mom says. <laughs> blash for my. Gosh. Oh no. Um, I guess I wouldn't know because they haven't talked to me for so long anyway. So they can't really distance distance themselves even more. I haven't had anyone reach out and express their uh, concern or be upset wow. with me. So. That's good. But also, I've only been doing it for a year, less than okay. a year. 
You may so, get some, so just prepare yourself. <laughs> and also, I think it kind of helps that I don't just focus on Mormonism, that I go into all different cults and backgrounds because right. it's it's a little bit harder. And this is interesting. So if they were to come to me and say, obviously all these other groups that you're talking about are cults, but Mormonism isn't, I would have to hold up a mirror and be like, are you sure? Like, are you sure that you can't mm -hmm. listen to any of these other episodes and just insert Mormonism into the title? Because most of them are the same as far as the oppression of women and children and authority over everyone and purity culture and all the things that could go on and on. So I think it would be a little bit harder for them to criticize having been able to agree that all of the other interviews I do are valid and are culty. Mm -hmm. Just a thought. I don't know if yeah. it's true, though. I've had uh, a few conversations like that with order because order members usually don't think that it's a cult. Like when you're in it, you don't think it's a cult. Yeah. So I've yeah. had them message me. Some of them just message me like uh, without no username. Like I have no idea who they are. But even when I first left, though, I ran into one of Daniel's daughters at Southtown Mall. And it's funny because we were we were like it's like in an if I was still in the group, she would have waved and been nice to me. Right. But because yeah. I had left, and I think at this point I was filming with Escape and Bullying Me, so I was a bad, bad girl. I I <laughs> was looking at dresses, and she apparently was on behind me, and I didn't know she was there. She didn't know I was there. We bumped back, and we turned around, and she literally just looked at me like I was like, like the plague. Satan. She like backed away slowly. <laughs> oh, no. I wish so bad that I would have went, boop. <laughs> They're like so scared of me. But at the time oh I was like, gosh. why is she like running? I feel like next time I'm just gonna like start chasing them. <laughs> just see what happens. Because ah, they're, they're afraid for no reason. The only reason oh, I'm, I'm no. scary is because I'm I'm speaking the truth and that's um what you know, the Satan's work, I guess. Last time. Yeah. Opinion. Well, and that's the thing. It speaks so much to the information control and the demonizing of people who say things that they don't like. I mean, really, you could just say something that they don't like and they're like, Satan, because they're <laughs> trained to believe that any bad feeling comes from Satan. And so and they train people to believe that when they when people leave the, the fold, it's because of Satan. They are literally being led by Satan. So monsters and demons are real in their minds and mm -hmm. they truly believe that you are possessed and evil. And so it makes sense that they would be so afraid. Right. Well, and because questioning. Well, I don't know if your group taught this, but our group definitely was like I was told this multiple times. Questioning is like questioning God. So I would feel guilt when I would be like, what if this isn't true? Or, or why, why yeah. is it this way? And I had so many questions. And so like to be taught that questioning is a sin, then every, you must feel guilty all the time because every day we have questions that, that yeah. how, like, how can you have a standing testimony without questioning? Yeah. So. Well, that's the perfect way to turn off someone's critical thinking and to help them avoid all the red flags that would pop up if you weren't conditioned to believe that certain way. I need to pause and bring on some super chats. Oh, Thank yeah, you so much, one. Laura. A deconverted Christian here. C2C has brought me hope that the best people I know aren't religious. You are a mentor to this Gen Xer. Thank you. Oh, that's so nice. That's really nice How to you hear. Can I pop up on the screen. That's so cool. So yeah, yeah. So we have Amanda here new to StreamYard, and I'm new to StreamYard too. So we're all learning. But yeah, there's a way that I just hit show, and it pops up, and it's so exciting. Wow. Um, thank you, Laura, for your donation, and thank you for your kind words. It's messages like these that help me keep going and and helping me know that these things that I'm putting out are actually helping people. So I really, really appreciate that. And then we have one. Oh my goodness. Did Mark just drop $50? Oh, that's so sweet. Thank, thank you, you Mark. so much. Seriously, it means you. so much. Yes. Such a sweetheart. Mark's been on a few of these. That's amazing. That's um, also, amazing. thank you to Vanessa. Vanessa sent a little donation. Your makeup is on point, Amanda. Fire, love it. Thank you. So yes, sweet. Vanessa. I love that. And just so you guys know, no matter where you're tuning in from, because we are streaming this simultaneously on Cults to Consciousness and Amanda Ray's channel. So if you send the super thanks while you're watching from Amanda's channel, that completely goes to her. And if you send it from my channel, that goes to me. So just so you guys know, uh, Amanda is getting these super chats from you. 
Um, it's, it's so confusing, but I hope to, <laughs> to get better at this. As long as they're watching it through her. Yeah, as long as you're watching mm -hmm. it through Amanda's page and you're sending it, then Amanda's the one that gets that. That's the thing that I love about this co-stream is we both benefit and we get to kind of mix our audiences and they can get to know each other too if they want to jump across platforms. But yeah, it's a really cool, really cool feature. And Andy, thank you so much. Sending lots of love to you all. You always jump on and send a little donation and that makes me really Aww. happy. So I appreciate you. And also, guys, I want to point out that if you are just here supporting, we love that too. Like, you don't have to send money, of course. It just helps boost a little bit and helps uh, cushion what we do. But even just by watching and commenting and sharing videos, that is immensely helpful as well. Um, I get so excited when I see the the returning ones. And like, I, I yeah. like this one, Lulu right here, she just donated. So excited to see you both. Lots of love. Lulu's been coming okay. around for like she's a part of the cult crew. We're we're family at this point. A lot of them. I yes. get so excited to see them every week. Oh, that's so awesome. Yeah, I love especially in the comments seeing the people like you said returning. I'm like, oh, I know that person. Like JoJo's always on there, and and also leaving really thoughtful comments too. That means a lot that you would. First of all, watch a video that's an hour long. And second of all, leave a really thoughtful comment about how you appreciate it or how it touched your life. Again, it just really helps us know that what we're doing and all this time and effort spent is actually helping people. So thank you guys. Mm -hmm. I did have a question from, well, a few of my Patreon members had a question for you about, because you have interviewed quite a few people from all kinds of different places in the world. Uh, what was one of the most like shocking ones that you've interviewed oh girl um don't say me talk about the, <laughs> should we do no should we talk about the one that like tr made me realize i needed therapy <laughs> yes um goodness. yeah so i did two videos with this woman she was from the children of god and her name is Daniela Mestanek Young. She wrote a book called uncultured and i think jonathan's gonna put a link below for you guys but she was raised in the Children of God cult, which was started in the 70s around the free love hippie era. And this guy who was just a predator thought, well, I need to stand out. So instead of going the purity culture route, I'm going to say that God is love and love is sex. And that means we should all have sex with each other, including with children. Oh, my God. So... It was, whoo, it was a really hard book to listen to. She reads it herself in the audiobook form. And so I spent two full days just sitting on my bed listening to her book. And it was really, really hard because I have my own child sexual assault going. And so I'm like, triggers, triggers, you know. But I really wanted to get her story out because it's so important. Oh, yeah. And, and, so the interview with her went really well. I wasn't triggered at all and it was great. And oh, sorry, I'm going to shut this curtain because my the light's coming in through the window. Um, so ugh. how I'm curious, how big Oops. was that uh, cult? Like, is there a number to how many people were actually in it? And does it still exist to this day? Yeah. So it the crazy thing is they were spread across the entire world so they would start communes in different parts of asia different parts of south america and it was they basically survived because of child labor oh light just fell everyone's okay the dog was not hurt he's <laughs> in the other room we're good um it was in different parts of Asia and South America where you could have high walls and no one would suspect anything. So in that case, they were all living together and no one mentioned anything weird. So there would be a thousand people to a commune. And basically, they also took to the extreme the Bible verse, spare the rod, spoil the child. So they would have routine spankings. If one child did something wrong, they would all have to line up and get brutally spanked and... It was just really awful and hard to hear. And that interview was definitely the hardest as far as editing goes. And I finally got a therapist after that. We did a whole live about it, actually, because I was like, we should talk about this episode. It was the first live we ever did, uh, Jonathan and I. And so update, I did sign up for therapy after that because... Oh, good for you. Yeah, I found out through my therapist and I was explaining how I was feeling during editing the episode, which usually takes anywhere from four to six hours. She's like, oh, you were having a panic attack. And so I'm like, oh, for four to six hours, I was having a panic attack. So it was a lot, but 
her mm -hmm. videos, I mean, they've soared past 100K and it's a story that needs to be told because yeah. yes, the organization does still exist. And they, I think I was going this direction and then I got sidetracked by my own thoughts, but they would use children to make money for the cult. So they would child traffic these children and make them dance and sing and they would sell these videos on the streets they would just literally send the kids out to beg for money and yeah so we talked about her story and i think the other most shocking and maybe it's not shocking to people who have been exposed to this but i was you know i grew up in a cult so we were we did not have any exposure to any other religions besides ours because they were of satan so mm -hmm. when i learned about the ultra orthodox Hasidic Jews, it blew my mind about the restrictions that these women were going through as far as having to wear wigs, like they weren't allowed to show their hair once they got married. Um, it's not the most extreme thing, but I'm just giving you a range of things. Um, have as many children as possible. Mm -hmm. um, lots of, it's like an arranged marriage situation. You don't really have a whole lot of a say and they marry you really young. And her story was about getting her kids out of it, realizing that she didn't want to be a part of it. She was also struggling with having feelings towards women. And so she wanted nothing to do with men. And she was forced to continue to have sex with her husband. And it's just really, it's a really bad situation. And even when she divorced her husband, once they saw her go out in jeans, because you're not allowed to wear jeans, they did everything they could, used all of the money that they would force people to give to the cause in the community, like force, force them to pay money for these lawyers to get her children taken away from her just because she no longer wanted to live the rules. And the courts actually ruled in the dad's favor. So that was shocking. The court wow. said, you, uh, I don't want to get this wrong. The courts were saying, you can't have full custody of your children anymore, even though he hadn't been present, the father, for a few years after they got a divorce. You have to continue to make it look like you're practicing this religion for the kids' sake. So she had to wear the religious clothing while they were going through this custody battle for like four years. And she wasn't allowed, legally wasn't allowed, to talk to her children about her own beliefs and values. It blew my mind how is everyone that legal i guess that was a lot of it's just legal but yeah i mean people are besides themselves in the comments that one just passed 300k views people are just like what is going on so yeah those are probably the two most shocking but every time i think i've heard it all something else comes up and i'm like wow the world is twisted and that's mm -hmm. why we're trying to expose all of this stuff which is why it's good that you have a therapist i don't think i could do this without my therapist <laughs> Yeah. But then there's other stuff you get triggered with your own personal stuff. And then like, I'm literally still dragging my feet on this one video that I, I can't get myself to edit. I can't get myself to really? even send to my editor just because I'm going to have to do a lot of therapy. For it. Yeah. <laughs> because, yeah. It's hard. It's so triggering. And then especially when you're talking about your own group too, it's like, yeah, ugh, this stuff's still happening. But the only way to have a change, it, like it's not going to change if, if everyone stays quiet about it. So the only way we yeah. can have there be some change is when people start speaking up. Yeah, so. it's hard. And that's why it's important to support your creators, guys. If you are enjoying the content, if this content feels like therapy to you, the best thing that you can do is like and comment and share the video. If you are able to send super chats or become patrons, it really makes a difference so that, again, we know that it's actually making a difference and then we will do what we can to take care of ourselves. But like mm -hmm. Amanda says, it comes with therapy and it's tricky and it's hard and triggering. So let's get to some yeah. questions. Um, oh yeah, I did get a super, is, is that what it's called, a super chat? I just say thank you for the donation. A super chat? <laughs> yeah, I think you're able to also put things on the screen. If you hover over it, it says show and then you can click it. Show, I don't, I don't. it says either you can oh, hide it, maybe. remove it. <laughs> oh, I guess only I have the power. I, <laughs> I guess so, um, but can I say well, thanks to Caroline real quick? Let's see, I yeah, got two of let them. Me, is it Caroline Reinhardt? Yes. Oh. Thank you, Caroline, for the donation. Love you both. Can you speak to how you each decided what you would use to determine your morals and values after you left your groups and no one was telling you what to think? Thanks for all you do. That's a really good question, Caroline. She's always yeah. coming in with those good questions. Um, you <laughs> yeah, want to go first start? or should I? Okay. You start. 
Um, that's a really, oh, it's such a long journey because I still kept a lot of the belief systems. Um, like I didn't want to swear. I, I, uh, still kind of feared the outside world and I didn't even realize that I was still bringing the cult with me for a while. Yeah. And then honestly, the exposure working with, um, out Outsiders, uh, the things that were really scary to me. I, I was judgmental when I first left. Definitely, like I didn't think that I was, but I, I, because compared to the judgmental order members, I was like um, so non-judgmental. But I started to learn over time that me being judgmental was really just hurting me. Like me yeah. being like, oh, I'm, I'm better than these people. Like I still feel like I had a little bit of that um, narcissism that they, they breed in you. Like I'm, I'm better than the rest of the world because I was raised this way or whatever but it's subconscious it was very subconscious mm -hmm. and so over time I think honestly when I finally was filing for divorce and getting out of the world because my, my husband I was married to was also from the group so all, our entire circle was still pretty heavily either ex-members or current members that I was trying so hard to have a relationship with um, so honestly it took probably a good seven years after leaving to realize like a lot of the belief systems I had were from the group and they were very negative toxic belief systems and so I guess my morals and values now come down to I think I've told you this on the other live stream but basically I live by two rules basically like treat others how you want to be treated the golden rule right but um mm -hmm. you can interfere with someone's life if they're we talked about this on a free agency live. My sister has a free agency podcast, but basically everyone has a right to their own free agency until they're taking the free agency from someone else. And then that's when right. you gotta step in, right? If someone's taking advantage of a minor or someone's doing, so I really just live by those two simple rules because I feel like when you have all these rules and all of this, I don't know, it's it. life is more simple than it needs to be. And you really just need to, you don't need to stress the little things, just be the person that you will, be the person that you would like to see in the world. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Sorry, that's a long answer, but it's because I, I've had to like rebuild my belief system over and over and over, and I'm still not there quite yet, but I feel like I'm getting to that point. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that, I think that it evolves and changes over time as you learn to become more compassionate and as you're able to see from new perspectives, because really that's kind of the key. And the reason why you were judgmental and I was too leaving Mormonism or any cult because first of all you've been told you are the best right the mm -hmm. the cult tells you that you are the chosen ones and then you automatically judge people but it's righteous judgment in your mind because you want to save those people so if I judge her for wearing a tank top then I can maybe be maybe save her and teach her that wearing tank tops are not what the Lord wants and this is how you get to heaven <laughs> and it's a way for you to save people so I think it's actually really accurate to say that it continues to evolve and change as you learn and grow about the people around you and that's another thing that's been really um, rewarding is seeing people in the comments say for example there was a story someone said she worked in a bookstore or works in a bookstore and she saw someone from the hasidic jewish faith come in they're pretty recognizable they're the ones that they wear the big kind of hats the big uh, for, mm -hmm. i'm sorry i don't know what it's called and they have the ringlets the guys in the front <laughs> and the long trench coats and so easy to spot so she said a gentleman came into the bookstore and was just reading all the books and not buying anything. And she was kind of annoyed by it. But once she saw my interview with Javi, the one I just talked about, she realized that they really have no secular education. They're completely isolated. They don't even know about their anatomy. They don't know how things work. They don't know a lot of the history sometimes. And so she realized, oh, I'm so glad that I didn't kick him out and I let him stay there until we closed because that was probably a huge deal for him learning about the world. And so when you have those perspective shifts, it allows you to make different decisions about the environment around you and the people around you and allows you to become more compassionate. So as far as morals go, I I really like, and I wish I can remember the, the name of the guy who kind of coined these levels of morality. We talk about it in an episode of Phil Drysdale. It's one of my earliest episodes where it's like there's a bunch of different levels of morality and 
the first one, shoot, I hope I don't butcher this. It's I do good things because I don't want to be punished. And that's usually where toddlers are. They start to learn, oh, if I try to get the candy, mom's going to say, no, you can't have that. And so, okay, I'll be good. And then the next one is I do good things because I want to be rewarded. So you walk and mom congratulations, you walked. Oh my gosh, you're amazing. Oh, I'm going to keep walking because I get rewarded for this behavior. And then mm -hmm. I think it goes into, I do good things because I want people to like me and it continues to go up. But the point is what he mentions is that usually people within religions only fall between the first and third categories. And there's six levels, which the top being, I do good things because I want to be a good person. And then there's some society things in there too. But usually religion stops you at, I do good things because I don't want to go to hell. Or I do good things because I want to go to heaven. Mm -hmm. And so when you start to get rid of all of the reward systems or the punishment systems, you start to think, well, why do I do these good things? Because I just want to be good. I just want people to have positive interactions with me. I want to do no harm to other people. And so having that framework, I think, is really beneficial to decide what kind of person that you want to be. And I think it comes innately. Most of us know what feels right and what feels wrong. Of course, there's exceptions with psychopaths and people out there who do bad things because they don't know. But mm -hmm. I think, generally speaking, we know what's good and what's bad. And just like you said, Amanda, do things that you would want people to do to you. Be, mm -hmm. do, be the person that you would like to be around. And I think yeah. that's kind of where I'm at. Oh, yeah. I think, yeah, we're probably on the same path. And it's also like a big part of it is self-awareness because you'll see a lot of narcissists in the group be like, well, I am the person that I'd want to see. But no, if you were... If someone was treating you the way you're treating me right now, you would not be happy. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's the easiest way to tell if they're a narcissist too, at least in my opinion, is if you hold up a mirror and mm -hmm. give them the same behavior, they will lose their shit. They will be mm -hmm. like, I can't believe that you did that. I'm being such a victim right now. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's like, but wait, you, did, what, what was this yeah. called when you were doing that? And either they'll gaslight you and be like, I never did that. <laughs> or yes. justify it in some weird way. But exactly. I have had members say, well, it's a good thing that I believe in God or that I'm in the order because what would stop me from, if, if this wasn't true, what would stop me from murdering people? And I'm like, and that's terrifying. I am afraid of you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if that's the only thing keeping you is, is the uh, idea of heaven and hell. You got to rethink your life. <laughs> exactly. We go into that too in that episode. It's like, I don't think I want to be your friend if that's the only reason you're being a good person. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day too, like it, it feels good to be that person and to to give and to at least for me yeah. the highest form of happiness is feeling like my my works and my life and, and what I'm doing is benefiting others mm -hmm. like I feel yeah. kind of empty when it's not like that I don't know if everyone's like that but definitely at the point in, in life that I'm at right now it feels it way gives more you purpose exactly that's the word I'm looking for purposeful Oh, yeah. Jay Snow just donated. Thank you, Jay Snow. Yeah, we're going to throw this up right now. Are the temples like, protected 24-7? Yeah. If so, how? Are they used for marriage only? So proud of both of you. Super women. Thank you so oh, much. Thank you. Um, I wonder, do you know if they're speaking about the mainstream Mormon temples? Or do you? did you guys have your own temples too? We, we didn't have temples, so I think that question's for you. Okay. Well... Protected 24-7, I will say there's high security and they lock the gates every night, um, but they also light them up like Christmas trees, so it'd be pretty obvious if someone was trying to do anything to it because it's so well lit. This is a funny story. It's kind of embarrassing. So <laughs> we were taught that the temples are so holy. Obviously, it's where God literally lives, like he walks the halls. They're so holy and important that they glow at night. And I remember, oh. <laughs> I remember driving on the freeway and looking out and seeing the temple because you can see them from really far away, especially in Utah where it's all dark and pretty and stuff. So mm -hmm. I remember being like, oh my gosh, look, mom, you can see the temple because God is making it glow, not realizing how much money they're spending on these lights to make it light up at night. You're like, it is true. <laughs> so embarrassing. I really thought that, but they also taught that, that the temples mm -hmm. would glow because of the countenance, right? And so anyway, oh, I, I have an embarrassing. Quickly. Too. okay tell me 
we so we would take uh trips to go see your temple we couldn't go in right because we weren't members but uh-huh. um they would take us around temple square and they would show us the temple and they'd be like so back in the day the temple used to be pure white when they when the lds church lived the true gospel but then when when they stopped living polygamy the temple turned gray can you tell look it looks gray and i remember as a kid being like oh my god the altar is true when you're a kid though like those little things are like staples in your belief system which is just stories that they make up but is it really that hard to believe that we would believe that because you tell a kid that santa claus is real and they believe it like of course Mm -hmm. you're gonna believe what your parents are telling you because why wouldn't you Oh my goodness. Did we answer? Oh, so are they used for marriage only? No. So in mainstream Mormonism, you have the temple endowments and the temple sessions. And this is something that was created in Joseph Smith's time. And a lot of it has to do with Mason, like Freemason stuff and the signs and symbols and secret handshakes. And this is how you cross the veil into heaven. It's very occulty, like with an OCC at the beginning. Um, and so they they also do baptisms for the dead, which I participated in as a kid. And that's fact, when they baptize rem- you, right? They baptize uh, a person in proxy of someone who died. Okay, because I totally for years thought you guys baptized the actual dead body. And I was like, oh, that gross. is, I know, because oh you guys would say baptism for the dead. And so the whole time I was yeah. thinking that until someone explained it to me. So for oh, anyone who doesn't terrifying. know, they baptize themselves in the name of you after you die. <laughs> great, great distinction there. Thank you. Clarification. Um, yeah, <laughs> so you start, <laughs> <laughs> you start doing that when you're 12. It's something that you're, you're kind of supposed to do. And you go on little group outings together for mutual night, which is where you meet at the chapel and have little lessons or whatever. But sometimes they would take a group to the temple. For us, it was like an hour away because we lived in the middle of nowhere in Utah, northern Utah. So... I even remember being worried that I wasn't going to be able to go because I had sinned. And it was something like I kissed my boyfriend while laying on top of him. And I remember being so like, oh, my gosh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it. And it was the first time I had to confess a sexual sin to my bishop, which was really disturbing. And anyway, that's what they do in the temples. (laughs) Yeah, I really feel like that the whole like confessing to your bishop shouldn't be a thing, especially for like underage kids. You don't need to be talking yeah. about your sexual stuff with an older man. That is yeah, so weird. Yeah, I agree. It's really gross. Oh, thank um, you for the donation, Aro. Yeah, we got one from Victoria here. This is my first super chat ever. Thank you, Victoria. Um, after my mom died, someone from the church called and told me she wanted to be baptized Mormon and wanted my permission. Wow, we were just talking about this. I was so taken aback. Big no, she is Catholic. Thank you for bringing this up. I'm sorry for your loss. Let me start there. Um But yes, they have no boundaries when it comes to who they baptize. I think we talked, was it in your episode, Amanda, we talked about how they'll be baptizing Jewish people and whoever, like they will just get Mm -hmm. a name and they will baptize them. And that's why I was like, do not try and baptize me when I am dead. I will haunt you forever because I'm not okay with it. Yeah, we we talked, I actually found out that someone did a baptism for the dead, I think think for my grandpa or tell who was the leader of the order Mm. i'm pretty sure because you can look on um what is it the lds ancestry or there's a site where you can see who got baptism for the dead for them oh interesting and they're like we're trying to bring him into the true church and ortel's on the other side going hell no yeah (laughs) i just thought it was funny i was like wow someone actually did a baptism for the dead for I mean, maybe he he told people to do that for him, you know, kind of like, just in case I was wrong. Just in case. I can't. Oh, that's so good. Okay, we have one from Ashley Mills. Thank you so much, Ashley. Your donation means a lot. I was in a foster home for a year that was a Mormon household, and this channel has explained so many things that I had questions about. (gasps) I'm so happy to hear that it's helpful for you. And... Yeah, that's so interesting being a foster child. I mean, let me say this to you. Generally speaking, this is like broad strokes, guys. Mormon families are so kind and so loving and sweet and they're good parents. I mean, that's their whole job is to be the best parent ever and raise up the kingdom of God, the the army of Helaman, if you will. And so 
I would hope that it was a positive experience. But again, that's a generalization. It's not in every case. But that's really interesting that you're starting to learn more of the nuances of things. And I'm surprised that they didn't try to indoctrinate you as well. Or I'm sure they tried to convert you. Did they convert you? We need to know in the comments. I know. Sometimes they're like my adopted family is LDS and they were really good at not trying to push me to go to church. I went to church a few times with them, but they never were like, hey, we're going to church. They were like, do you want to go? Do you that's not want to go? That's so good to hear. That's so good to hear because that's not the case for some people. Um, okay. We got a super thanks. a -row, thank you for the super mm -hmm. sticker. Um, I just realized we've been going for a while, so I want to um, get to all of these. Yeah, and then I we have cool. yeah, Kathleen. Kathleen. Thank, Thank you so you, much. Do you want to read this one? Yeah, let's see. She is XIBLP. Hey. And you are right about the cross triggers. It's insane, but most cults seem to work from a very similar playbook. I found Hazen's bite model to be incredible. I have been referenced that multiple times, and I need to do more research on that. But oh, you haven't checked it out yet? No, I need to. It's really helpful. Um. I actually, my very first episode ever of c to c I'm a little embarrassed of the production quality, but uh, I talk about my story, leaving Mormonism, and then the bite model at the beginning. And really, I only recognize that Mormonism was considered a cult by these definitions probably during 2020. And I was introduced to someone, Ashley Easter, I've had her on the show before, but she had this really easy to understand little booklet on her website about what's considered a cult. And... I lost my mind. I was like, oh my gosh, it actually is. I thought this whole time people were just being mean and being dramatic, but mm -hmm. by the definition, so behavioral control is the B, information control, thought control, emotional control, and they go into wow. all the different ways those can be manipulated. And it really is staggering when you look at the data of, oh yeah, that was pretty culty. And it doesn't mean that your group has to have all of them in order to be culty. And again, cultiness is a spectrum and mm -hmm. there are obviously some that are way worse than others, but it's just helpful to be aware of those things so that when you leave a cult, you don't jump into another one unknowingly because a lot of mm -hmm. us have done that. I think yeah. also a lot of people jump into relationships that are culty. I think your relationship can be a cult and it's a, a two person sure. cult, but that was a really good, I'm gonna research that more. Thank you, Kathleen. And also, yeah, I feel like you. watching that documentary about the IBLP was so triggering because it was so similar. She's so right. That all the cults have a, basically a same baseline, like a pyramid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they really do. We have a comment here. Love hearing you talk to Amanda. What's her channel? I want to subscribe. Amanda Loves Rachel is the at. Or just type yeah, in Amanda Ray. Ray. She'll, pop, <laughs> she'll pop up immediately. So everyone, if you haven't already and you're watching from my channel, go subscribe to Amanda. Thank okay. You. We have this one from Jen. Thank you, thank you Jen. Jen. Been looking thank forward to this live, even if I was a little late. Thank you for putting the truths out. That's okay. You're here now, Jen. We love you for yeah. it. <laughs> She's here all the time. We love her. I think I also had a, a question. Re you can read that one. Let me find it out the question while you're reading it. Okay, so Heather, thank you so much, Heather. So generous of you. Everyone needs a therapist. Tell me. Uh, mental health is incredibly important. Thank you for giving so many people a platform to share their experiences. Hearing stories from others is a big help with making sense of my own experiences. Thank you so much for sharing that. I love hearing those comments. It makes me, again, feel like I'm doing things and it's making a difference. And mm -hmm. it just makes me really happy. So thank you so much, Heather. Mm -hmm. I had a um, one of my Patreon members did have this question and I I wish I looked it up to reference this Bible verse, but apparently there's a Bible verse that talks about how um, nothing should be uh, added or taken away from the Bible. And she mm. was asking, like, don't you doesn't that mean that the LDS church is wrong for adding things to the Bible? Or do you guys ever even talk about that verse in in LDS teachings? Right. Well, that's a tricky one, too, because they have their own scripture. So, mm -hmm. you know, they literally created the Book of Mormon. And I don't know, they change it all the time. They they won't tell you that they're changing it. But almost every year, they are 
reworking some of the words to be less problematic. And I personally think that's why they encourage you to buy a new Book of Mormon every year. They say it's because you should go through and read it every year and mark it up. And then the next year, start all over. And I think it's because they don't want you to notice that it's changing. Yeah. Um, and having said that too, with the Bible, they have the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. Did you guys use that actually? Um, we just had this, I remember we had a quad and it had, you know, yeah. Doctrine and Covenants, like it had all of it in one and all of us would have, I mean, if you saw any kid over the age of 13, they probably had a quad with their name on yeah. it. And that's yeah. why I thought everyone in the world who was Christian believed in Joseph Smith, because I thought that was the Bible because they would give it to me right. like that. But they also yeah. would say things like, cause I, um, I would run across Bible verses like that too, but like. I would also run across Bible verses that said things like, don't lay with your sister. And I would, I would point it to it and she'd look at my dad <laughs> and he would say things like, well, uh, the Bible has gotten into the wrong hands and some, some verses were put in there by, but so it's like, basically they're deciding which parts of the Bible to use and which parts are not. But I don't know if you, the LDS church did that at all, right? Like, oh, this verse was, was not supposed to be in the Bible. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know, because I know that they, they would go through every year you would focus on a different part of it. So one year was New Testament and then Old Testament and then Book of Mormon and then DNC, I think is the way they structured it. So we did learn from the Bible, but I don't ever remember it being a huge staple. I don't think they would ever really pull talks from it. It was always from the Book of Mormon. So they're just it just wasn't really something that we dove into, at least from my perspective. And maybe that's because I wasn't the most devout reader of it. I mean, I would read it, right? Like your eyes are reading the words, but I would never really understand it because it's also kind of BS. But I don't remember having specific Bible studies and picking out certain verses. So I'm not really sure. Yeah. And maybe you guys believe similarly to what we did, like the newer stuff is what's more important. So what Joseph Smith wrote is what's more relevant. I guess. Yeah, exactly. And also the living prophet, right? So whatever the living prophet says is what is true, even if it contradicts something the original prophet said. And that's mm -hmm. always something that, that's the way they would get around Which things. So, yeah, it's so interesting how yes. isn't God's word always standing, but I guess not really. <laughs> I guess not. Uh, so that actually le leads into this question from Charles. Shalise, could you talk a bit about how you deconstructed? How did you find out how to do it? So that was one of the inconsistency things when I started looking into the history of church and realizing all of the awful things that the early prophets had said and done. And the new prophets just pretended it didn't happen. And that's what really got to me. I was like, something's off. Why didn't I know that this had happened? Why was I outright lied to about the history of the church? I'm not okay with this. And I mean, I was also 20. So, and I was going through something really difficult with the bishop and him telling me that I was a sinner and the worst person alive and not that dramatic, but basically that's how I felt was mm -hmm. I could not be any lower on the totem pole in God's eyes and I needed to fix myself and really I wasn't doing anything wrong. So when I started finding out all of these things about the church and all the lies and the book of Abraham being completely not true now that they have it and they can look at the scroll and cross-reference, I just allowed myself to drop everything. Because I thought, well, if this isn't true, I don't have to feel like a piece of crap anymore. And I can actually do the things that I want to do and not feel like a sinner and not feel so guilty all the time and wear the clothes I want to wear and date who I want to date. So I think in my case, I was just so ready to be my own person and be independent that it was easier for me to just drop all of the doctrine and the theology and just live so mm -hmm. I don't know if I have a good answer as far as, I mean, I didn't even know it was called deconstruction. I was just like, oh, cool. I'm going to set that aside and go do mm -hmm. my own thing. It's what was it like no for more. you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you have a similar Mine was depressing. I, yeah. I didn't realize it was de deconstructing either, but I think I mentioned I almost joined the LDS church on one of our lives or one of our um, videos. Yeah. Did I say that? Yeah. Uh, I think so. Because I, I found this sense of, uh, I still believed in God and I still believed in the idea of keeping the Sabbath day holy and finding the true church. I believed in that. I was like, I yeah. need to find some place to, to keep the Sabbath day holy. Like I, I want to, it was all from a place of shame though. And I didn't realize it. 
I was like, I need to, like, God's going to be mad at me. God's going to, da, 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 da. I had this terrible relationship with God that he just was, mm. like, always upset with me. So uh, one time I was uh, talking to missionaries and I actually had someone who was atheist who left the LDS church give me this big book of all the things that don't make sense with the LDS church. And he's like, read this. And I was like, was it the CES letter? No, I think it was like being passed around amongst ex members that, that people were adding things to. So it was kind of like a manual um, folder. And one of the things in there was the, the, the Egyptologist debunking uh, Joseph Smith talking about the, you know what I'm talking about? That, Uh that piece in the, in the Bible, not the Bible. What, what book? Is the book of it's Abraham? the book of the book of Abraham. It's its own book, like the DNC. Yeah, and and apparently Joseph Smith was like, "Oh, I can use my seer stone to say to interpret this," <laughs> and he interpreted it, and that blew my mind. I was like, "Oh my gosh!" So he just lied about being like being able to read Egyptian, and then yeah. I even asked my adopted family about it, and and like it it really for some reason that one stuck true to me because i was like he was lying me too that was the yeah. number one thing that i was like oh well shit if you made up that he made up the rest it was just an easy if this is true then that's true situation so that and it's so of, funny both of us did you ask your family like why that is and what what was yeah. the response yeah i that was one of the main things that i took to my mom immediately and i was like did you know that this Egyptian papyri that he, quote, translated, they have now, and they've since translated it, and it's a normal funerary script, not the Book of Abraham, not written by Abraham? And Mm -hmm. I think I need to do some more research in this because it comes up a lot, but I believe that the Book of Abraham is what talks about the levels of heaven. Like, a lot of the theology of Mormonism comes from the Book of Abraham, and I think that's also where they talk about Uh, dark skin being a curse and so most of the stuff that people aren't cool with is in that book and to find out that it's not a translation and now they'll even say it's um it's like uh it was inspired by the the papyri or something I'm like guys like that's the answer I was getting that 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 God was showing him something different through that 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 needed to be said and I was like (laughs) what (laughs) yeah it's just one of the ways that joseph smith and his grandiosity got him in trouble because he just would go around giving prophecies like no big deal like oh this is an ancient document i can translate that by the power of god and then it came to bite him in the butt but no it's because sorry for anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about he joseph smith basically took this uh this piece of paper that was uh he he bought it he would buy random things from like that were imported right that mm-hmm. were in different languages and he would like say that he could interpret them and then yeah. but no one no one could read egyptian so then they're all like right. wow like we don't know so he must be what right. does it say yeah that's yeah. the thing so he he bought a literal mummy from a traveling mummy show and in the sarcophagus was this scroll which we know now is extremely common and it, you'll find it in almost every sarcophagi that you open up that's from egypt and so that's what's so comical about it. He even called it reformed Egyptian, which isn't even a real thing. And so, yeah, he was just getting himself in trouble. Um, okay, I want to bring this one on the screen from Joanne. Hey, hey, what's up? Uh, both Cults to Consciousness and Amanda Ray are a big part of my healing. Thank you both so much. Thank you so much, both of you, for doing this necessary hard work. You are so welcome. Thank you for your very kind comment. Those kinds of comments, like I've literally cried with the messages and the comments where people are like resonating with my story. Because in the beginning, it was like, we need to tell people what's going on in this cult. And then it came and it turned into this community of people that are like so supportive. And so like we've we've lived the same lives, but in different worlds, right? So it really, really, those comments really hit hard for me for sure so thank you I should probably say oh wait you have one (laughs) you're good (laughs) Elizabeth Davis thank you for your donation I've decided to look more in my inner spiritual self as far as my religion that's a beautiful thing to do highly recommend it to anyone even if you think you have your spirituality figured out it's always good to do a reassessment and see if it's something that you believe it's something you want to continue to believe if it's something that brings you peace or if it's bringing you down I think it's always a good idea to do that Mm mm-hmm Definitely. Being able to have a good relationship with yourself is probably the most important relationship that you need. (laughs) 
than you. So sorry. I want to say thanks to Mark Lee. He donated again. Oh Thank my you, gosh, Mark. Mark. What was it like for the both of you the first 24 hours after you escaped? Where did you go? Did you have a place to stay? Was there anyone on the outside there to help you? Oh, wow. That's a that's a deep one. So I had run away multiple times. So each each time in the beginning, the first few times were really, really scary. But um, the last time was more cemented. But it was also like, I don't know what I'm going to do or where I'm going to go, but I'm definitely not going back home. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think I slept very well the first week out. I was kind of like couch hopping, trying to figure out where I was going to go. But then eventually got a like 500 or I think it's 500 or 700 square foot apartment that I was paying rent. So, mm -hmm. but it was, it was survival mode for a long time. And I didn't even realize I was in survival mode till I finally got out of it. I don't know if it was like that for you. Yeah. So for me, leaving Mormonism, you don't really have to escape. Like it's not, the stakes aren't as high as it was for you guys. And because there's no real community and there's no real boundaries or anything. Um, so when you leave mainstream Mormonism, it's more of the emotional and mental stuff that gets to you because people could just choose to stop talking to you, even your own parents. And like I was saying, for me specifically, my parents were already on their way out. And so I didn't have to deal with people icing me out. Um, so I will say I got lucky. And I got lucky in the sense that when I decided to leave, I immediately went on a study abroad in London. And so it took me, plucked me right out of my environment. Nobody knew I wasn't going to church. I was just doing a thing out there. And two weeks when I got back, two weeks after I got back, I moved to Los Angeles. So again, no one to really check in and be like, what's going on with Shalise? Why isn't she coming to mm -hmm. church? It was a lot easier for me. That's good. Wow. I almost yeah. wish that I would have just moved out of state because that, that would have helped so much with the trauma if I would have just right. left Utah. But there was that pull of I need to I need to make that connection with my siblings. Like I, I, I love my siblings so much that I, I was willing to go through the emotional turmoil mm. just to see them for the short amount of time, you know. Yeah. This is a, oh, a good so question for you, and this is a very special guest, John Billings. He actually has a YouTube channel if anyone wants to subscribe. He is my cousin who left, and he is the son of um, the leader. <laughs> He's asking you, did you ever hear of the Kingston or FLDS growing up? No, not in the slightest. <laughs> I had no idea you guys existed. I had no idea people were still practicing polygamy until I moved to Vegas. And then people were asking me about uh, Sister Wives or Big Love or whichever one filmed what? out there. Had no idea. So I was like yeah. 19 when I first I heard about swear, it. People in Utah, it's not like you're trying not to learn about it. I almost feel like the Mormon culture, like they don't want the anyone in, in Utah to know about it. Because I get recognized from Escaping Polygamy everywhere but Utah, <laughs> which is, <laughs> it's like they don't watch it there or they don't oh, stream funny. it there. I don't know. But, that is um, so funny. It's also yeah. ironic because you did live by order members. Apparently, I had order members reaching out after we went on our on your channel and they oh said, gosh, oh, tell me. there are people that went to, um, so it wasn't the night, I thought it was the night, but it was a few of. I'll have to get their last name. I'll have to message you privately. You have wanna, to like, tell me who it them. is. But yeah, they because... grew up in the same area. Whoa. Yeah. So for those who don't know, I grew up in a rural part of Utah in Tremonton, which is really close to Idaho. And I don't know, population 5,000 or something. We had a pretty big high school, but that's because it was pulling from a 30 mile radius. So <laughs> uh, that's so interesting. Um, wow. Yeah, I didn't know they existed. I, in fact, when people would ask me how many moms I had after I left Utah, I would just get furious with them. I'm like, we don't do that anymore. That's not a thing. Yeah. <laughs> I would yep. get so mad. I, I would get furious with LDS people that would say that, which is, it was usually missionaries. So when it was when I was on my way out, um, my mom would sometimes let missionaries come over because, you know, they'll, they'll fix things for you. And I think my yeah, mom just sure. liked having someone to talk to. But she would be like, Amanda, please don't do it today. And I would go in there and I'd be like, do you know how many wives Joseph Smith had? And they would be like, um, actually, he didn't have any wives. And I'd be like, actually, right here on LDS.org. <laughs> My mom would be like, go to your room. 
Oh my gosh, I love that so much. Oh, trust me, I've had the urges many times when I see them on the streets because the poor souls, they don't know. These missionaries who are sent out by the church, and these missionaries, by the way, are paying to go on missions, paying to bring people in to make the church more money. And they're they so don't young, have the information. Yeah. They're 18 to 21. They don't know what's going on. And then they get hit with a brick wall of the world being like, polygamy joseph smith used a hat put his head in a hat and like all the things book of abraham and they're just like what so i almost feel like probably yeah probably a lot of missionaries uh, after their mission they're like i don't believe this anymore yeah this is what i've noticed especially after being in the exmo space for a while the exmo podcast for space mormon stories all those groups it seems like It can go one or two ways. You come home and you're like, screw that noise. I am done. This is insane. I was lied to, blah, blah, blah. Or they double down and Mm -hmm. they go, that is just clearly ex-Mormon propaganda. They are trying to bring down the one true church. It just proves even more that it's true because the adversary is working over time to bring it down. So it's very interesting. Yep. I think that happens in the order too, where where the more you have to testify your testimony and then have it questioned, then you're you're either going to be more delusional and be like, this is the, like Paul can do no wrong. Yes, he married underage women, mm-hmm. but it's because God said da 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 da. Mm-hmm. Um, or you can go the other way and be like, this can't be true. But I I have a lot of respect for the LDS people who will openly just be like, yeah, I don't believe in how Joseph Smith was, but I do like the teachings. You know, just just yeah. own it. Just own it for for what it is, and it's okay to be a part of a community and not believe in everything. You know, right? Yeah. You don't have to be black and white. <laughs> I agree. I'll have you read this one. Let's see. Are you making me say it because you don't know how to say the name? <laughs> no, <laughs> it's such a pretty name, and I don't want to butcher it, so you say it. Oh, it is pretty. Kayla? I, she says, "Yeah, thank you for the donation." She says, "I had to have inter." section i just got out of my therapy session this is my goal every day do the next right thing be the change you want to see in the world thank you both for the strength you have that um that quote uh be the change you want to see in the world was on um i remember the first time i saw that was on my my cousin andrea andrea from the skin me it was in her bedroom and i was like i i want to live by that that is so true so that's a very good quote I love it. Thank you so much, Kayla, Kyla, for I'm your so, donation. I'm so sorry. <laughs> we don't know We're so it. sorry. <laughs> okay, let's bring up Victoria. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry, my previous super chat was not a question. I'm new to this. It's totally fine. We're new to this too. We're all in this mm-hmm. together. <laughs> We're learning. We're learning. Definitely. And Charles, thank you so much, Charles, for your super chat or super thanks. I don't know what they're called. Someone help me out here. I know. I would um, just say donation. <laughs> thank you for your donation, Aero. Wait, didn't you already donate? Um, how did you both handle being around other races once you got out? Was it hard moving past the racism? Okay, I'm going to start because mine is not that bad. I wasn't taught really about the racism i didn't know they viewed native american people as actual sinful lamanites i knew about the curse of cain and the white and delight something but it was never really taught at least in my household about racism uh in fact i always had a thing for people of different races uh hence my crush on usher and my (laughs) now husband so i didn't even know it was a thing i will say though where i grew up I don't know if there were any black people in our entire town, like at all, not even, Mm -hmm. I can't even think of a single family. So I also wasn't exposed to any culture other than very watered down, whitewashed, white person's culture. (laughs) Well, the majority of Utah too was so like, I think when I was growing up, the statistic was like 80% of people were LDS. It's different right. now, but like, and that right. means like majority of them were white, even in the school that I was, I had a chance to go to public school for a little bit there. I could count on one hand how many people were not white in the whole entire school. Yeah, they, we did have a pretty generous population of Hispanic and a few people who were Asian. Um, so I, I don't want to X them out. That was a thing. But still, it was, 
I don't feel like I was exposed to actual cultural backgrounds that they, they all felt the same. So mm -hmm. moving to other places, especially Los Angeles, I was like, whoa, this is so cool. The cr cultural diversity and the different types of music. I just felt like I grew up under a rock and I love traveling just for the sense of getting to know other cultures and what people are up to in other parts of the world. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna clarify, not five in the entire school, probably five in my grade <laughs> that I knew oh, of. There you go. <laughs> there you go. It was a decent sized school. But yeah, as far uh, as racism, um, for me, I, I don't I didn't tell you this story actually. I'm I was sorry. called the, the N word in my did I tell you this story? Wait, what? In my own church. I was Why? a kid bullied me and called me the N word because my skin is I guess two shades too dark. <laughs> So I'm kids, sorry, what? I know. I have, I mean, I believe, this is what my dad has told me, that we come from some form of Native American. So I I was told I have like a quarter or like my dad's a quarter Native American. I'm not sure because my DNA results didn't show anything, but I, I and another student had uh, relatively, I would say like, we, we would just tan very easily in the sun. So me and him yeah. would get called the N-word in the private enzyme learning center school to the point where my sister... Cammy was really sad that I was getting called that so we were uh young and so it was like the time where we would uh, everyone just bath time right we were just little kids and so she's in the bath with me scrubbing my skin being like it's just dirt it's just dirt because she didn't <gasps> want me to get bullied anymore being called oh the n-word and I am actually really grateful for that experience because it forced me to know what that's like to be called that and I right. never wanted to call anyone that and I didn't understand why they cared so much to call anyone that word so I didn't right. like that word I grew up I mean I'm not going to say that I wasn't like this perfect person in this cult but I definitely did not use the n-word and I definitely it caused me to question why can't we mix with them why can't you know because we again like yeah for those of you who are new here in the order they believed in the 12 tribes of Israel that the kings and bloodline is the direct descendants of Christ which is why they believed in all the incest and inbreeding and that you should not mix your race yeah. You should keep within your race. So a lot of racism. And I, of course, the whole like um, sitting on the fence story that we talked about. But do yeah, you say that came from sense. Mormon culture? Yeah. The, so the sitting on the fence? From, yeah. Oh, I don't know if you hear my little dog barking. He's chasing imaginary squirrels in his dreams. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> little Oscar. Okay, let's keep going. Um... I, sorry, I totally cut you off there by putting this one up too soon. Okay. Oh, you're good. Rossi, you are amazing people. Thanks for all you do to help us understand the world. Even my mainstream parents' beliefs were toxic for my family. Yeah, I, I do agree with that, that you don't have to be in a place that feels extreme, that the outside world can easily identify it as a cult. If you have these certain belief systems and structures that are put in place to push you down and make you feel worthless and affect your life in a negative way it can be seen as culty and it can be toxic so that's another reason why we do what we do is just to spread awareness about these different ways that people can control and manipulate you and how it can have a negative effect and how to firstly acknowledge that and then from there you can do what you can to get out of that get therapy or whatever it is that works for you mm -hmm. yeah I think therapy helps so much for me so you just started therapy though right yeah, girl, like a week ago. It was rough. <laughs> My first session. Really? Was your rough. first one? Yeah. Oh, it was so bad. Yeah. <laughs> Did you cry your first session? They say if you cry your first session, they're supposed to be a good therapist. But honestly, the first, I don't know. I don't like crying. <laughs> yeah, it was not a good time. And I will say that I didn't know, and this is a little bit of a tangent, so I won't spend too long. I didn't know if she was a good therapist because I was so triggered or if that means she was a good therapist but I was like do I like her I don't know how I feel because I'm really triggered and upset but she had good points so I'm still debating on if I want to continue with her <laughs> yeah it sucks because I did have one therapist where she she made me cry the first two times and I never went back but I think that it forces you to work through the stuff quicker but I need a yeah. gen more gentle approach <laughs> yeah I kind of feel the same way okay thank you so much five dollars per aspira ad astra I hope I said that right. You both are doing life-saving work. Thank you. P.S. I use my Amanda Ray mug for coffee every week. That's amazing. Woo! Go buy her oh, merch. I, I need that. to get some merch. <laughs> no, I need to make more of those mugs. It was really hard. We sold out and I 
the idea of making a unique mug, like I had this idea of having every single mug be different paintings of trees. It Whoa. was so exhausting. <laughs> I don't know if I'll do that again. Those ones sold out though. It makes me so happy that people still use them and they yeah. drink out of their culty cup of coffee. I love that. Yeah, if you guys don't know, she does a live stream every Sunday called Culty Cup of Coffee where you can check in with her and she talks about stuff about the order, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. We're, yeah. Tomorrow is number 79. We talk about the, because in the order we have the numbered men and uh, I'll talk about who has the number 79. So awesome. yeah, we kind of just go into a little bit of order history. I've heard a joke in the cult actually that, that was going around the order that I order people uh chime in and try to like watch my lives because i'm giving them order history that they didn't even know about about the numbered <laughs> men they're like oh huh. okay. interesting you're, well you're welcome <laughs> sarcastic salsa awesome uh omg i did a paper on the book of the dead for school and came across the book of abraham stuff and wow robert rittner did great work on that by the way that's awesome yeah, I, I should really do a whole episode on stuff like that. In fact, I want to try and do an episode with Bryce from Naked Mormonism because he knows so much about the history of the church. And he was bringing up documents in an episode with Myth Vision of actual occult like drawings and super witchy stuff, which I found really interesting seeing as how mm -hmm. the Mormon church now is like, that's satanic and stay away from it. And it's like, that was your your roots, your beginnings. So mm -hmm. I need to do a whole episode. You on that. did it. You were on Mormon stories, no? Were you? I so I interviewed John Delin, and so I'm talking about Naked Mormonism. It's a different podcast, but yes, oh. I I oh did gosh, an episode so <laughs> two. I know there's so many. I did two episodes of John Delin, and he just reposted it to his channel. So kind of on his show, but not entirely. Okay, um, but I need to write down that other one because I definitely want to look into that. It's Naked Mormonism. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much to Lena. Uh, every time you guys talk about the Texas raid, I forget about Jeff's. I think about the Branch Davidians that lasted 50 days. Do you want to comment on this one? The Branch Davidians? So I think that's I, another cult. Are they, is, they are they talking about Waco? Isn't Waco, wasn't his name David? I'm not 100% sure. I've Texas heard too. of the Branch Davidians, and it's probably another cult that I need to do a deep dive into. And I've heard about Waco, but I don't know much about it. So, yeah, but it was in Texas, the Waco thing. So maybe it is the same. Okay, yeah, it looks like some people in the chat are saying, yes, that is Waco. Yeah, Davidi Davidians, oh, okay. Davidians. Did you watch oh, that Davidians? series? No, but I just got Paramount. I think it's on Paramount. So I was planning to watch it to yeah, see what's going on i was very like intrigued and then as soon as he started living polygamy it's like why is it that every man that has the leader <laughs> of a religion decides polygamy is what god said god yeah. said <laughs> so that means i did to do it or else yes specker thank you so much for your donation uh grew up in another christian cult i appreciate c2c thank you so much i appreciate your support doesn't it um, does it ever shock you that there's so many people that have been through similar religious basically religious enslavement almost yes actually and so we're even talking about doing something more mainstream maybe with netflix just talking about these cults that people don't realize are happening right next to them or they don't know mm -hmm. what's going on within them or like the ultra orthodox which i know again i know i keep talking about this and it's not the same within every ortho uh, blah, 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 ultra orthodox <laughs> group but even just understanding what's going on behind those doors can again help you become more passionate compassionate when you see them so i think it's just wild the things that are going on right under our noses especially if you say there were probably polygamy kids in my high school that i didn't know it's just mm -hmm. wild the stuff that's going on yep it's all around us oh there's yeah. emma i love emma <laughs> oh my gosh there's so many questions and we've been going for an hour and 23 minutes this is wild okay let me pull up one or two questions and then we can um we can end this do do do, do. Okay. yeah Let's i feel see. like we could go on and on and on and on because there's so many so many different areas we could go yeah trail amazing, off on <laughs> yes um thank you so much and then we have Oh, this is a good question. It's for you. So you can read it. Okay, let's see. 
Amanda, do you feel like you had an adequate education in the order or do you feel like you were missing a lot of common knowledge when you left? Oh, mm -mm, I did not get enough. I didn't even know who Hitler was till I started going to public school. I was like, what? And kids what? thought I was either joking or they would say like, or were you living under a rock? I'm like, apparently I was because I didn't know. And then um, I still like really have been realizing how bad my spelling is, how bad my like mm. my education on like history and things like that. I am lucky enough that I did go to a public school for two years, but yeah, there's a lot of areas that I feel like I, cause, cause they really just wanted me to graduate from Penn Foster as quick as possible because then you can get married. Right. So a lot of girls yeah. would, would be, some of them would even be going to public school, but then when they were like 15, they would pull them out of school and have them do uh Penn Foster so that they could get married and get pregnant. And so, oh, wow. Um, Luckily, that didn't happen to me, but yeah, I do feel like I definitely am lacking on a lot of education, which I don't know what to do about that. Like, I've gone to college, like, I did a few classes, and, and I was fascinated by psychology, fascinated by sociology. Mm. Those ones were the ones I really enjoyed. Um, but yeah, math, I I failed two times, <laughs> and I almost math failed the third time. Yeah, but it was like... I don't know. Even when I went to public school, I failed pre-algebra twice. Like, I don't know. I think that the math was lacking in the order school a mm. lot. <laughs> I don't know. But Yeah. I also feel like it's one of those things that sometimes you just can't get caught up. Like, even now with pop culture stuff and music and movies that we weren't allowed to listen to or watch. And it's just you kind of have to just accept, yeah, I'm always just going to feel a little left out when people start talking about it. Or mm -hmm. um, you just learn as you go because there's no possible way that you can make up the time that you've lost. Yeah. It, even if you go to college, like you were saying, there's just going to be holes and you just have to fill it when you get there. <laughs> yeah. My sister was talking about how it was really hard. That was one of the things that were really hard for her, was really hard for her when she left the order was constantly feeling dumb when people would bring up history and she just right. hated any topics of history because they didn't get it brought up. But I'm always like, well, Hey, at least like, cause I have XFLDS friends were like, I'd be like, you never watched this movie or you never watched, like there was so much stuff that was shelter for them. And so, mm -hmm. but also it, some of them have said, it's kind of a good thing because then I get to watch Pocahontas for the first time and I get to watch <laughs> all these and appreciate shows it. for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess it just depends on how thing. you look at it. <laughs> Yeah, Jonathan's like, well, it's exciting because now I could be the one to introduce you to this for the first time. I'm like, I'm glad you feel that way, babe. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. nice. That's, that's a positive way to look at it for sure. Yeah, definitely. Oh, thank you for the donation, Kathleen. Kathleen. Thank you so much. Saying. People don't realize cults are everywhere. Your next door neighbor could be in a cult and you would never know. And also, people often ask about how do we help these people who are in cults if you are able to recognize or how do you recognize. It's really a hard thing. And you touched on this, Amanda, in our episodes together about, first of all, even if you are able to single them out, it doesn't necessarily mean they're willing and ready to accept help. So mm -hmm. you can't just go up to them and be like, I can get you out and then be like, who are you and who says I'm in a cult and they can get really defensive. So I would say to that, just being kind to everyone that you meet and make yourself feel like a safe place for people, because mm -hmm. just being that example of kindness can be what someone needs to feel comfortable to come to you when they are ready to yeah. ask for help. Exactly. Because it is, it's a shock. Like, as I was reading that, it's like, what did she say? They could be anywhere. Oh, they sorry. could be your next door neighbor. You yeah. could be in one without even realizing. Yeah. Well, that's what's yeah. scary is like, if someone were to tell me I was in a cult while I was there believing it, I wouldn't trust them and I would be very triggered. So the way to approach it is very, very different. I think just being able to also have have the resources readily like on all of my live streams I always try to have well all of my videos I try to have holding out helps information in the description box down below for any yeah. members that because I do feel like people that are consistently watching my channel if they're in the cult they are curious and they're at that point to questioning things right yeah so just having yeah. that information there for them <laughs> oh man well oh Lynn thanks babe did you just pop that up uh, Lynn's question, Amanda, how many are currently in the Kingston clan and how many do you know of who have left the cult? Um, 
gladly i feel like a lot more people are leaving every year but they're also popping out a lot more babies every year right right <laughs> when i was in the group i remember there were times where i was going to weddings almost every weekend um sometimes throughout the week there was like a secret wedding because it was a plural plural wedding and those ones are like more hush hush so they are procreating way faster now because there's so many of them aside from the ones that are infertile right because of the inbreeding right but i do feel like me and my sister have tried to we're like trying to put the puzzle together we think that there's at least 10,000 members still there but i feel like every year there's at least one or two that leave which is pretty big because you think about two percent only two percent of people in this cult will leave so i feel like that's pretty big, right? One to two people that leave per year. Sometimes families will leave all together, which is always awesome because they, they don't yeah. have to lose their family in the process. But I don't know a number of how many are out, but you think, I honestly do believe though that the, the biggest population of people that have left are from Daniel's family. So Skating mm. Polygamy, Jessica's Daniel's daughter, Andrea, Colleen, Chanel, all of those, I was the only one that wasn't Daniel's daughter. Oh. <laughs> so. The biggest population is Daniel's family, at least. Yeah, we've actually had a lot of requests to have people, the the girls from the show, come on to C2C. So if you wouldn't mind making an intro, yeah. if you think they would be willing to come on, because a lot of oh, people yeah. are like, I want to I wanna hear from them. And also your brother, so many people are like, we want Eskel. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure Eskel would be so happy to. He would be down tomorrow. Um, and Amazing. I am going to be visiting with uh, Jessica and Andrea, I believe, for the 4th of July. So I'll, I'll oh, talk cool. to them about it. <laughs> that would be awesome. Um, okay, here's a question. I'll let you read this one. Oh, Chris, Christine. I'd Christian, like to ask Christian. Christian. <laughs> you keep Christian. doing this to me. <laughs> Just <kidding. laughs> um, I'd like to ask your opinion on cult leaders in general, since it seems there are similarities along many of them. Where do you see them on the spectrum from true bel believer to conscious scammer? I, I have pondered this so much about my own cult leader because I'm like, there's no way that he believes in God. There's no way he believes he's doing the work of the Lord when he's he's married to at least two of his own nieces and two of his own half sisters. And he promotes underage, you know, marriages. And all. like, also when you have 27 women 20 like even having 20 like keep you keep thinking you want more and more and more how can yeah. you really think that you're not just being selfish you're not yeah. just because those kids aren't gonna have a relationship with you you're not gonna be a good father figure you have mm -hmm. to he he must sorry i, I get so triggered with this he Tell is me. one of two you be the screen people. for this <laughs> <laughs> he's one of two people thank you <laughs> hear, hear me hear me He's one of two people, and this is just what I believe, and I don't think I could believe anything else. He either believes that he is God himself, and he just has this high narcissistic, like he's on this pedestal that he will, he, everyone just lifts him up on that pedestal, and he just thinks that he's like be the best thing on the damn earth. Yeah. Or he's an atheist, and he knows what the hell he's doing. Mm. There's, there's no, in this case, it's either black or white with him. Yeah. If that's what I believe, but. What about with your, cause it's not called leaders, right? It's called um, presidents. The presidency, the first mm -hmm. presidency. Yeah, this is a highly debated topic because you would think if you were the profit of a $300 billion company, you would know the history of it, right? You would think. So everyone is wondering they can't really believe that it's true like with everything that's out there about the true history of it about what's going on with their finances about how they're misappropriating funds they're not really helping the poor and the needy like they say they're doing with everybody's tithing money they're required to 10 percent of their income it's just really hard to believe that they don't know and mm -hmm. people will say uh action mormons will say well I don't think that they, I don't think they see anything wrong with it. Of course, they're true believers. Or why would they donate their time? And that's where you have to laugh because most people don't know because they tell you. They tell you when you were a Mormon that every single position in the church is volunteer. But it's not. When you get to the high ranks, 
they are making hefty sums of money to be in the positions that they are. They are getting jets. They are getting homes. Their grandchildren are getting full ride scholarships to college. They get perks and they make it so it's not a salary, but they, they call it something like a stipend. Okay, because I was going to ask, like, how do they do they get have to pay taxes on that? Is it like an actual job? (laughs) I don't know how they do. I'm sure they have figured out ways to get around that, but they make it so it's a stipend. And we know this because someone leaked a statement of one of the the authorities and it showed what they make. And I, I can't remember. I wish I remember what it was, but it's a lot of money. So if you knew what was going on in the history of the church and you're like yeah this is kind of a big scam but you're making over a hundred thousand dollars a year just to give talks don't you think you you might do it if you have that superiority complex and you've already been born and raised and brought up in this religion to believe that it's the one true thing whatever when you get to the top i feel like after you make all those sacrifices you'd be like well my family is benefiting from this. You know, I don't have to work a normal job. They get paid all the way up until they die because you can't, right. you don't leave the presidency. You literally have to age up until you just die. So yeah. it would make sense that they would stay in for all the benefits. And imagine if one of them did defect because the shame and the ostracization that would come to their family, it would oh, probably yeah. be a shit show if one of them That's actually did bounce. Point. I yeah, have thought about that with Paul. Like, what if he ever wanted to step down? Like, y- you get so deep into it that you can't leave. Like, you're yeah. stuck now. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. And I mean, thought. not only the income, but just the shame and the things that would happen to your family. I've talked to John DeLynn about it on his episode. So for those who don't know, he's pretty much the the top voice in the ex-Mormon space. He's been doing it for literally 20 years, interviewing people. And he talked about his family and the cost that his family has gone through, where kids won't play with them at school, or they're called names, or they have smear campaigns against John, things that are just outright false because they're trying to bring him down because he's out there speaking the truth. So you can only imagine what would happen if someone in the high ranks of the church were to defect. I think it would be colossal damage. Yeah. That is crazy to think about. Okay, let me bring up some more super chats. Thank you guys for all of these. Andy's yeah. back. Andy, thank you, Lynn. thanks so thank much. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Andy. Sorry, there's so many that I'm like, I, I, I don't want to yes. miss any of them. <laughs> we'll bring them all onto the screen. Don't worry. Okay. So Andy says, how do you respond to ex-members who say we are being unnecessarily negative or critical of the former organization and think we should just not talk? Man, this is one. It drives me nuts because... We are so used to people going out and proselytizing and spreading the word of the Lord. But the second you try to say, actually, here's a more peaceful route, they're like, I can't believe you would shove your beliefs down my throat. It's like, guys, you've been doing this for centuries. Why is it not okay for me to speak? (laughs) Yeah, I can speak my truth. And what's wrong with me saying this didn't work for me? This caused a lot of depression. This split up my family. And talk about what does bring you peace because... I think you have every right to do that. And so it makes me mad. And I know that there's no easy answer and there's no polite way to really say it to someone. I guess just saying, I have to speak my truth. And I know that I was suffering while I was a part of this organization. And my thoughts are, if I'm suffering, there's a really good chance that someone else is suffering. So if I can Mm -hmm. speak my truth and talk about the negative things and talk the perceived negative, right? You think it's negative because it's taking down your organization. I think it's positive because it's bringing people out of it so that they're not in pain anymore. Mm -hmm. I think that it's important to share these things and maybe it's going to help someone out there. And if you don't like it, you don't have to watch it or you don't have to be a part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing that I've said too to uh, order members is they're like, well, why are you saying all this about Paul? Especially with the the video where I talked about how he's related to all of his wives. I was like, I am, I am simply stating the facts of what he's doing and holding the, him accountable. That is it. I'm yeah. not lying. I'm just simply yes. saying, like you can you can go look at all of his wives and you know that I what I am saying is true. So if it triggers you that I am putting a light on what he is doing, maybe you should think about why that triggers you. Exactly. <laughs> because all I'm doing is telling you what he's doing. Exactly. But it's also um, I've also said it, holding the group accountable is good for the group as well. Because yeah. then it, it helps them to be able to progress, right? 
if they're going mm-hmm. to progress. But sometimes I don't yeah. feel that way. <laughs> I think it's important. Just like you said, people will say, I can't believe you're spreading lies. I'm like, girl, it's on the church's official website. Go mm-hmm. look it up yourself. Like, I'm just speaking about what's actually going on and stuff that the church has already admitted to, but they won't tell you that they've admitted to it. So go look it up yourself. Don't take my word for it. <laughs> yep. Yep. Everything yeah. is hey Val thank you that thank speaking you, of Daniel's Val. kids he's one of Daniel's kids that left <laughs> hey <And> he, <laughs> Thanks, he did Val. um an interview on my channel he has a really awesome story too there's so many people mm, that that I, I'm like if I could out. give you a list like of all the people that I think you should interview that have amazing please story. do <laughs> please give them. me a list <laughs> that would be great Lynn thank you so much you two are just the best love what you're doing and sharing aloha and mahalo Oh, thank you so much, Lynn. Brooke, you're both so inspirational. It's great to see you together. I love that. Thank you. you, Jonathan's putting them up there real quick. (laughs) Paula, keep talking. I know. I'm like, should we keep going? There's 613 people watching between the two of us. And I don't know if you guys are getting bored or if we should just keep. I mean, I feel like we could talk forever. So let us know if you want us to keep going. (laughs) I know. I'm like, should we do a poll? Thank you guys so much for all these donations. You guys are so sweet. So awesome. You ladies are, oh, you ladies are awesome to bring these cults up and tell the truth about them. Thank you, Diane. We're doing our best. Doing our best. Mm -hmm. Denise, Amanda, and the combination of you two. Love you, Denise. I see these are the comments like when I first started YouTube I didn't get any of these it was all just me order members so it's like gives me life (laughs) oh thank you so much I think it's Jean or Jean Jean. maybe it's just Jean Jean I'm sorry guys you have really cool names and I feel like I'm butchering them but I I have an excuse I I didn't learn how to read in the group I came from (laughs) oh I don't have an excuse I'm (laughs) I'm kidding Thank you, Jean. Mark Lee. I hope this is oh, the start of a again. very long, great collab relationship. You both are inspiring, smart, and so much fun to watch. I love that. I think, mm. you know, like in uh, Step Brothers, I don't know if you ever saw that movie. Did we just become best friends? Yup. Oh, <laughs> I feel that's, like that's, that's the... I was telling my patron, I was like, I hope she likes me as much as I like her. <laughs> I, I told them I kept pushing, like, I'm going to come to California. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Let's be friends. be friends. It's official. <laughs> yep. Hey, next time yeah, you're going to be in California. <laughs> Sounds good. Come on down or up, whichever direction. Okay. <laughs> uh, thanks for your coverage regarding shiny, happy people. It's needed and absolutely necessary. Yes. Yeah, so we have been diving into the IBLP, the Institute and in Basic Life Principles run by Bill Gothard. Well, not anymore. He got kicked out because he was doing inappropriate things with children um, and young women. So the IBLP striking similarities to fundamental Mm -hmm. Mormonism, which is why we did an entire episode with that. Our most recent episode was with Sam and Melissa from growing up in polygamy. And yeah, do you have, I love them. Do you have any thoughts on that from your perspective and your specific group of how they're similar? I think the thing that triggered me the most was the, they actually had a picture representation of, the umbrella right where there's yeah there's christ and then the the you know the the father and the mother and the children and the order mm-hmm. was very similar like the women will tie into the the husband and then the husband mm-hmm. ties into the leadership so no matter what in the IBLP and in the order for your entire life you as a woman will be underneath a man no matter what mm-hmm. you will have to yeah. submit to them and that's that was a big part of the control for the IBLP but yeah and then obviously like the sexual abuse getting brushed under the rug that's something that's so common in a lot of religious groups i don't i think it's just like the the fact that it's victim blaming and it's always the woman's fault then that's that's going to make so that there's no accountability on these men and then it's going to just breed more of it right yeah which is really sad yeah so for those who aren't familiar the iblp they are an extreme christian fundamentalist group and they're not their own religion. So what this guy did was he created these workshops and these seminars, and he would attract people from different Christian denominations and say, I have the answers. This is how your kids will be happy and healthy and thrive. You don't have to think about anything. I'm just going to give you the playbook. And these are the rules that you should follow within your household. And so it permeated every sect of Christianity 
all over the world actually he had training centers all over the world and the the main points of them were have as many children as possible so you can raise up the saints and infiltrate society with these ideals so literal handmaid's tale situation mm -hmm. they wanted to infiltrate government and they even did get these programs into some police academies and military programs and in prisons and the ideology is what amanda was saying the umbrella system where you basically just oppress women let's just see what let's call what it yeah. is call oppressing it women it and children <laughs> yeah and the other parts of the rules where um women should always wear dresses and never pants never anything too tight they were what they called eye traps don't be an eye trap for men mm -hmm. it's your responsibility to make sure that they don't sin and yep. they would say if you are assaulted it is your fault because what were you wearing and you clearly you gave them the wrong fault. idea and if you were assaulted it's actually a blessing from god because god chose you to become spiritually stronger so oh disgusting and wrong yeah. and they didn't believe in any sort any sort of um like tv as far as you can only watch it for four hours a week this is what my interview with jen uh talked about she said she could only watch tv four hours a week and it was very limited usually it was just watching things that were produced by the iblp um no outside tv or music drum beats were considered satanic because they came from africa really mm. really problematic stuff here and abuse was just rampant because of yeah. this because of the men feeling like they could have complete control and authority over the children and the women they highly encouraged beatings as far as spanking your kids into submission they had this thing called blanket training where you put children that are not even toddlers yet so you could start at six months old put them on a blanket put toys that they want on the outside of the blanket and when they reach for it you slap their hand so you're just beating them into submission until they look at you for every decision and and obey it's basically i forgot to lead with abuse. this if you've it, it's abuse if you've ever seen the duggars 1920 kids and counting and the tv show they had on tlc they were part of the iblp and they are the ones that really popularized the ideology and why it got as far as it did yeah one thing too answer. that that i think all cults have in common is this uh fear that they put into all of the followers this fear causes i actually was doing research on this because of my psychology class fear causes us to not think rationally so we are more willing to submit and listen to the to the leadership if we're in this state of constant fear, right? Fear of mm. judgment, fear of God, fear of, you know, your kids not getting to the celestial kingdom or whatever, yeah. then you're more willing to be submissive to the leadership. So if you are someone who's living your life in fear or people in your life are keep putting you in fear, uh, think about the situation that you're in because you're, you're, you may not be thinking completely rationally in your, in your frame of mind. But all yeah. of these cults have that, the fear-based control. And it's so hard to shed. For years, I always thought, wait, what if they were right? And now I'm going mm -hmm. to outer darkness because I turned away from the one truth. And really, it's yeah, it took a while for me to just be comfortable knowing that it's all made up <laughs> because fear is such a powerful motivator and it gets people to do a lot of things. It even gets them yeah. to dictate which underwear they're wearing, right? When it comes to Mormonism yeah. and who Was you that can hard have sex for with. You? to not wear your garments anymore? So I never got to the garment phase because okay. I was unworthy. <laughs> oh. No, I, so traditionally when it comes to mainstream Mormonism, if you're a woman, you only get your garments when you get married in the temple, or if you okay. were too much of a sinner to get married in the temple, you can go to the temple a year after you've been married civilly and you're still doing the right things, then you get your garments. Or if you go on a mission, that's another reason right. you get your garments. But aside from that, if you're just a single woman doing a thing, you have to ask and ask and plead to get your garments before that. So wow. I didn't make it to that point because I left when I was 20. Oh, I guess that's good. And then did you didn't have mission. to go go through like having oh to gosh. shed that. Because I feel like it's similar. I've talked to some ex uh, FLDS and ex LDS and it's similar to like not wearing the FLDS dress anymore. You feel right. like naked almost. <laughs> well, so. and the reason behind that, because 
I'm sure people in the comments who aren't familiar are like, why is it a big deal to change your underwear? So the garments, the temple garments, we just learned more about the garments. Go watch the video with Sam and Melissa. She gives a little rundown of the history of it. But basically it's these underclothes. It's like a full on t-shirt and shorts that you have to wear under everything. And you're told that it is your protection from the outside world, that they will literally protect you from harm, which never happens it's just like a thin not even a nice fabric they're just really uncomfortable women have had so many issues as far as their lady bits not being able to breathe down there and they're hot obviously and it's supposed to be the closest thing to your body so for women you have to put your bra outside of the garments it's I remember mm -hmm. watching my mom. I always thought it looked so funny. Um, like, what are you so, doing? <laughs> yeah, and they have symbols. Like, there's symbols here and on the stomach. And I think in different places, I'm not entirely sure because I didn't have them. But they are very sacred. They're the most sacred thing. In fact, when you are done with a pair of garments, which you can only buy from the church, it's another way for them to make money, you have to cut out the symbols. And then I believe you have to burn the garments. So you can't even just throw them away in the trash so they make these things out to be super sacred to where mm -hmm. you feel really guilty if you don't wear them and if you just toss them and if you finally take them off because imagine having this literal feeling of comfort on your body and then all of a sudden you're just wearing a thong or a bra like mm -hmm. it probably feels really naked yeah and like, i feel comes... naked under these clothes <laughs> <laughs> yes, and it comes with the shame and the guilt. Now, there's a lot of people, I'm sure, that feel differently. For example, there's the loopholes of you don't have to wear it when you exercise. So I've known of women who just use use that and it's excuse to wear their exercise clothes around the house and shopping mm. because they're like, I'm going to go to the gym, and then they never do, and so they're not wearing their garments. Yeah, totally um, and when you swim, yeah, when you swim, obviously, that would be really funny, seeing a bikini over those, and when you have sex. But... I was told that in the early days, like grandma's generation, you were even supposed to have sex with them on because there's little holes like in the men's. And I don't know how it would work for the women because oh they don't God. have a hole there. But even someone mentioned in the comments, their grandparent would shower one part of their body with the garments still on one side. So like, let me get this side wet while I have a leg in on this side. And then I'm going to switch it and then shower this side of the body because they're told that they could never take them off it's kind of extreme that is insane yeah so thank goodness you didn't have to wear them but I'm also still a little baffled I guess that the the guilt followed you because it seems like you were so headstrong when you left but I guess people say that about me too like you seem so headstrong but I went through this phase of like crying and like I, I was a full-on atheist for a week and I was depressed mm. and then I came back but I guess the guilt followed you for what do you say years yeah, it was more of the fear. I would say okay, I was okay. able to drop the guilt pretty soon because I was just tired of feeling that way. And I was like, if it's not true, why am I feeling guilty for wanting to sleep with my boyfriend who I've been with for a year? Like, doesn't make any rational sense mm -hmm. to me. So I, that's another part of the cognitive dissonance thing is when your heart and mind and body and soul are telling you you shouldn't feel guilty for something that's so natural and then you have this organization that's supposed to speak for god telling you that you should feel guilty it's this huge battle in your brain you're like how oh, yeah. this doesn't make sense and then they break you and then you feel guilty about it and you repent mm -hmm. and it's a whole thing so the guilt i was able to drop pretty soon but it was the fear the fear of what if i'm wrong and what if these things I read online actually aren't true. And I'm turning away from my mm -hmm. spot in heaven, my cushy spot that I've been working toward to get to the highest yep. level of Mormon heaven, this cushy spot. What if I'm turning away from that? And all of that work was for nothing. That's yeah. the thing that stuck with me for a while. I definitely had similar thoughts, but I always felt like what brought me back to like reality, I guess, was the thought of, Amanda, do you really want to go home to a god acting like this that's like throwing tantrums if you're gonna you know choose to kiss a boy before you're married <laughs> like he's gonna be yeah. like that's a bad mark in heaven amanda three strikes you're out like really is that gonna be heaven i don't know satan sounds more loving and forgiving at this point <laughs> <laughs> he wanted all of us to get to heaven automatically seems like a cool exactly. dude <laughs> he's like, everybody gets a ticket you get a ticket you get a ticket <laughs> <laughs> oh no guys don't go thinking we're satanists that's not what we're saying but you get it <laughs> um Nicola says, oh, wait, sorry, babe. 
uh, shiny happy people. I missed it before you you just shiny, it up shiny happy people. The the documentary that just came out about the IBLP. I guess they're yeah. they're talking about what we were talking about. The IBLP is called okay. Shiny Happy People on Amazon, Amazon Prime, Prime. Right? If you yeah. want to watch what we're talking about. <laughs> Ray, C to C is so close to 50K. I know it's yes. so cool. I would love it if you are on the chat right now and you have not yet subscribed. Help me get to That's that 50K. Right. It would mean a lot. So I know that there's people you can see in the analytics, people who watch who are subscribed versus people who watch who aren't subscribed. And it's usually a pretty big difference. Like 75% of people who watch the videos are not subscribed. And I'm sure it's because they can just come and check in anytime they want. But this is me um, advocating for subscribing. When you subscribe, it tells the algorithm that you like what we're doing and it pushes it out to more people. So just hitting that button makes the world of a difference for us as far as having a greater reach. And also it notifies you when we post videos so you don't have to keep checking back. So if you like the channel, hit that little button. <laughs> Same with Amanda's. Oh, um, Kathleen, if you need an inside view on SHP, feel free to hit me up. I know the whole background of it and I ran away at 22. Wait, oh, shiny happy people. I was like, what's SHP? Yeah, go ahead and email me, um, colts to consciousness at gmail.com and we can chat. BC home for now. $50, you guys. You're so sweet. Thank you. I will, I watch both your channels religiously. <laughs> Love that. Grew up Catholic, but I can relate to many of your experiences. Keep up the good job. We need more super smart, fierce women in YouTube. Amanda, I lovingly urge you to go back to college. Oh, that's sweet. Wait, I can't hear you, Amanda. Your mic is gone. <laughs> Nope. Did it come unplugged? Did it die? Is there a cord that goes to the wall? Oh, wait, you're muted. Why are you muted? Un... Oh, it says your mic isn't connected. I think her mic hasn't been connected. And I think it is going to... What about now? There you go. Yeah, you're back. Because my headphone like died and then I pulled this one in. I'm hoping this one stays um... alive. Okay. You know? Yes. Okay. I don't so know. So Jonathan up. thought that maybe your mic wasn't connected and we've only been hearing you from your headphones. No. <laughs> maybe. I could be wrong. Wait, I've been tap holding your mic this like the this. whole time. Yeah, it's not on. <laughs> <laughs> we did a That's test. Right. Remember, I was like, can, did... can you tell if it's close to me? Oh, well, no. That was my bad. We were scrambling to get this set up at the last minute but <laughs> i guess you don't have to hold it anymore if you don't want to thank god <laughs> two hours oh in. my gosh so funny oh, okay so what were you saying okay, man. Jeez. oscar wants to join <laughs> oh can i say thank um, you to yeah you were about yeah, to respond to this comment on the screen right now Oh, okay. I watch both of your channels religiously. I grew up Catholic, but I can relate to many of your experiences. Keep up the good work. We need the super smart, fierce woman. You too, Amanda. Wasn't you? Oh, college. I was just making a joke that I've I've been told that by some family too. Like, go back to school, sweetie. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely want that. to. Def when I have more time to be able to, because right now this is taking a lot of my time and it's yeah. my priority. But if I can have more time to like take classes on the side, I would be so happy to. Did we yeah. answer Kathleen's question? If you need an inside view on SHP, did we answer that one? Yeah, I told her to email me. Oh, okay. Now we have Jason. Jason, thank you for your channel. I was in a cult and your channel helped me talk to my wife about my past. <gasps> thank you, your channel really helps people. That's Aww. amazing. That just fills my heart. Thank you for sharing mm. that. That's yeah. really it's awesome. definitely not something to be ashamed of. I I was for a while like I wouldn't tell people where I came from because I didn't want the judgment. But the people that what is that quote? The people who mind don't matter. The people who matter don't mind. Right? Yes. <laughs> so good. Um, I hey, killed I'm... Earl. <laughs> awesome. Oh, Thank you so much for the donation. 
I am a card carrying Satanist because it gives me protection under the law as an atheist. We're not scary and follow humanist values, not Satan. We don't believe he exists and we've got cookies. Well, I mean, if you got cookies, sign me up. <laughs> or the also, chocolate too, it's my favorite. Have you ever looked at Satanists? They have like the seven rules of Satanism and they're actually pretty like, honestly, they don't sound like Satan, at least the definition you know of Satan that I grew up with. I would love to look into that because... Yeah, definitely the view of Satan that I was raised with is atrocious. But as I'm mm -hmm. learning about more groups and being more educated on certain things, I would definitely be interested to look into it because why not? Yeah. Okay. If my, I'm going to try to, I don't know how much longer we're going to be. I don't know how much longer this has though. So if I go silent. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Yeah, a few more questions, and then we can wrap it up. We said that like half hour ago. Ray, what's up, Ray? I recognize Ray. Question for Amanda. Could you see any event that would make the Kingston clan want to combine with other Mormon sects? Um, That's interesting. I I think that there's there's been times where the, the order has went down to the Crick, the Colorado City, to, like, help them or, like, be a part of certain things. And I really think it's mostly to have the women join our group because they don't have, they believe what they believe. So they're not going to say that any other church is right except for theirs. So they're only going to want mm. to bring people in. I've never seen them trying to like join two cults into one. Right. But I have seen them co-mingling with like the AUB group here and there and the FLDS, but it's usually afterwards you'll see like members joining like, like Tom Green, for instance, they were mingling with him for a long time. And then at the end of Tom Green's life, he joined the order, brought all of his wives and family, then died of COVID in the order. And then now the order has all these women and, and kids and mm. things like that. So, yeah. So combining with other like, fundamentalist sects, but never the mainstream Mormons. Oh, Mormon. Remember, we were saying that it's like the, the high schools that hate each other. They do not like the LDS church. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But some ex LDS girls have joined the order or like oh. married into it, I guess. Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Because, because I wonder what the appeal system. I wonder what the appeal would be though, because you're signing up for more oppression. Yeah. I think some of them didn't really know the extent of the order until they married, and then others were like, I'm not joining, but I'll marry you because I love you. Um, oh, right. Yeah. But there's also sense. stories of one woman who was from Norway. She was completely not even a U.S. citizen, met a guy in the order, fell in love with him, married him, and then found out he was in the order after she was married mm. to him. So I think there's That's some cases rough. like that, too. Yeah. Um, Ooh, that would suck. Um, question. Last question from Solatil. <gasps> I love your name. Uh, R.E. Kingston Groups. Is there anything like that? Is there anything that is positive, wholesome, and attractive about it? Uh, that you never have to make a decision yourself because they make them all for you. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. All right. That's it? <laughs> I mean, polygamy doesn't... I mean, to some men, they're like, oh, polygamy sounds great, but it's not what you think it's going to be. And also, yeah. like that—that that, saying polygamy sounds great is also like saying oppressive, oppressing women sounds great. <laughs> right, it's not a good look. Mm -hmm. It's not a good look. All but, right. I mean, well, some people do. Sorry to to do one no, good thing. Is some people find stability in the fact that they do have homes and jobs and things like that. Like they have their own little world right there but that doesn't mm -hmm. mean because they would say well how are you gonna find a job in that on the outside and I, I would get worried but I was getting paid way more on the outside than the two cents that I don't you know what I mean so right. in your brain if you believe it then it could seem like a great thing but that's also hard to entice a new newcomer to it thank yeah, you Noki sure. just talking about holding out hope oh perfect yeah thank you for bringing that up if you yep. need help escaping polygamy or if you want to learn how to help, visit holdingouthelp.org. Mm -hmm. so, and there's a hotline amazing. number yep, for anyone who's like just wanting to call and ask questions. There's a hotline number that you can call just to and you can remain anonymous. They're not going to tell on you. <laughs> That's great. Awesome. Well, this has been so much fun, Amanda. I did not anticipate going for two hours. I should have known, I know. better. <laughs> but 
so much fun. We're definitely going to have to do this again. Thank you to everyone who was watching. Thank you for your super chats, your comments, your support, your subscribes. Yeah, if you haven't you done so, so yet, please subscribe. It means a lot. And um, yeah, we'll definitely have to do this again. Any final thoughts before we go, Amanda? Um, I think that's it. That was a good way to end it is holding out hope for anyone who needs the resources. And Amazing. Yeah. Well, go support Amanda. Uh, go over to my channel. There's tons of interviews there that you can continue. Definitely go watch the ones that we did with Amanda. There's two of them on my channel right now. You can find it under the new This Week tab. And until next time, follow your highest excitement, be conscious, and be well. Yeah.